Welcome to Zeitgeist Radio, the podcast for music lovers to expand their horizons into new and interesting musical subcultures. I'm your host, Morgan Rowe, founder of the Zeitgeist Academy. Each episode, I interview someone from a different musical community. Zeitgeist means spirit of the times, and my goal is to make that spirit come alive for you and help you appreciate musical communities you may not know much about. Before we get into the episode, head over to zeitgeistacademy.com slash radio. You can see episodes and transcripts and also sign up for my newsletter. There's always more to a topic than can be covered in one conversation, so each week I send a deeper dive into something related to the topic. You'll also be able to access the archives to see past content. That's Z-E-I-T-G-E-I-S-T Academy dot com slash radio. My guest today is Emily Cohen, a rabbi from Brooklyn. Emily, welcome to Zeitgeist Radio. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really happy to be here. I'm so excited. You and I have sung together many, many moons ago in choir in college, and I have a lot of very happy memories with you. <laughs> so it's very, I'm really looking forward to seeing uh, where you've gone and what your journey with music has been um, and your journey generally. So um, for our listeners, can you give a brief introduction of who you are um, and also who you consider yourself to be musically? Yeah, I'm, I'm professionally, I'm a rabbi. Um, I am the rabbi of West End Synagogue, which is a reconstructionist congregation, which is too complicated to get into what reconstructionist <laughs> means, but um, it's a progressive Jewish movement. Um, and it's about a 200 member family or 200 member family unit uh, synagogue on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. I live in Brooklyn. Um, I've been an artist forever, so, you know, lots of music, also a lot of writing. I, I do some Jewish journalism and um, some creative stuff that we'll get into. And I also sing with a secular choir in Manhattan that just does like, actually, we do a lot of sacred music, but it's a secular ensemble. We just rehearse in a church and, you know, end up singing a lot of stuff about Jesus because that's what happens. <laughs> I have choir. friends here who like aren't choir people and they're, I'm like, come to my concert because you're always like, come to my concert always and they're um she, actually she's jewish and she's like is there going to be jesus and i'm like well the, i mean y you can't not <laughs> yes there will be jesus it, yes. um, <laughs> but not like that kind of jesus just like singing jesus yeah or know? just you know that's, that's who writes the checks to the composers right and exactly. a lot of very beautiful music so <laughs> yeah. and when you sing in a church the acoustic is really nice oh, the so acoustics are so good yeah 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 Awesome. I'm so happy you're still singing. That's great. Um, I would like to start setting this conversation uh, with an overview of uh, Jewish music generally, the music that you have that you have played publicly, um, and then just kind of get some definitions going. <laughs> so because sure. my knowledge on this is not very great. So can you kind of is there an overview of like music in the Jewish scene that you can kind of set the scene for us? Sure. Um, that is a question that could take the rest of this hour, but I will give like a brief overview. So like, like Judaism is an extremely musical tradition. Um, our liturgical stuff is based a lot on different modes of chant. So we read the, the Torah, which is like the Hebrew Bible. Um, so, you know, Genesis, all that stuff. Uh, and there are particular modes of chanting that. So we don't just recite it as like written words, we actually chant it to music. And the same is true for most of the prayers that we do in synagogue. And some of these modes of chanting are over a thousand years old. Others are, have been developed much more recently, but we really were an oral tradition first. And so there was a lot of music that came in as part of that. In addition to all of the liturgical stuff, there's a huge folk tradition that has been around also kind of forever. Um, so what's probably most well known in Jewish music is klezmer which is um, a mostly European form of Jewish music featuring clarinet, particular scales that are like neither major nor minor. They're kind of, um, it's called like the Freilicka scale. Um, and then there's also a bunch of other music forms that come from different parts of Judaism all over the world, because while the most well-known kinds of Judaism in the United States are Ashkenazi, which is this, you know, Eastern European Judaism, there's also a lot of really wonderful Sephardic Jewish music coming from the Iberian Peninsula and from North Africa. There's some Israqi Jewish music coming from the Middle East and other parts of the world as well. So everywhere that there are Jews, there's Jewish music and there's a lot of languages as well that are combinations of Hebrew with 
local languages. So like Yiddish is probably best known. So that's like Hebrew and German, but there's also Ladino, which is Hebrew and Spanish. There's, um, you know, Syrio Judean, which is like Hebrew and, you know, like there's just so many different languages that this works with as well. Wow. I just learned so much. <laughs> so, okay. <clears throat> is there a difference then between, um, just because I've had some folk dancers on here, including Anastasia, who you oh, know cool. as well, yeah. um, Israeli dance, Israeli music is kind of in the folk scene. It's its own thing. Where does that kind of sit in? Is that, I mean, there's, there's klezmer and my understanding is Israeli music is a little bit different. And is that also considered Jewish music? Like, like automatically, like, well, so in Israel, you have a lot of Jews. You yeah. also have a lot of Arab Israelis who yeah. are people that come from Muslim and Christian backgrounds, like Palestinian Israelis. Um, and so the, the most popular music in Israel right now is actually Mizrahi music, which is that kind of North African, Middle Eastern music I mentioned before. Yeah. And there's also, a, of course, a good bit of klezmer and kind of more classical music. So yeah, I would say music produced by Jews is Jewish music, um, right. <laughs> you know, regardless of like kind of what the what the point is of it. Like, you know, my dad's a composer. I would say that his music is Jewish, even if it's not written specifically with like Jewish motifs, just because of the fact that he happens to be a Jewish composer and I'm a sure. Jewish composer. Sure, um, sure. And maybe I can't quite say that because like, obviously, if you're like trying to write a pop album and you happen to be Jewish, maybe you're not bringing Jewish influences in. but. The question of what is and isn't Jewish music is a little bit difficult to pin down. Sure. Yeah. So what would you consider, like, what's what's your style that you lean into? Like, who are some of your influences? Where do you draw your inspiration from? Um, I mean, I'm definitely a folk person. So there's been like this kind of amazing revival in Jewish folk in the last 10, 20 years, like, you know, certainly since since I've been an adult. Um, where it, like when I was a kid, there were a few artists that were sort of, sort of like folkish and poppy in their orientations. Like I grew up with some of that. Debbie Friedman, um, may her memory be a blessing, was really a trailblazer in the Jewish folk scene. Um, she was really active, this awesome like lesbian who just like had so much Jewish music that like people sing stuff all the time in the Jewish world that they don't even know was written by Debbie Friedman, but like was. And so she was probably my first influence when I was a kid, but then as an adult, there's these incredible Jewish writers, um, Joey Weisenberg, Deborah Sachs Mintz, um, Josh Warshawski, like, I mean, I could keep going, but there, there's just been this really intense renaissance in how we do Jewish music and how we bring new melodies to these ancient prayers, which is really cool. Yeah, that's amazing. I love it. Um, so what would you say, I'm so interested in, in the role of uh, how you're saying that you chant. And actually it's funny because again, I'm, I'm not Catholic, but I've sung a lot of masses just because you're a singer yeah. and then, then you do, that's what you do. So I've sung so many passages of the Bible so many times. And one time I went to our, I, I knew someone whose family member passed away and I went to a Catholic mass and they just spoke it. And I was like, mm -hmm whoa, 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 stop. What are you doing? Like, <laughs> right, it was right. so weird to just hear That's it. That's what you do. Yeah. Said. I'm like, I've spent literally 45 minutes just on this phrase. So, um, so can you, can you, um, how do you see the role of song, um, versus just the spoken word, um, when you're expressing ideas, either in a, a sacred or in a secular, um, environment? I love that question. I mean, it's interesting, like in the in this like sacred context, certainly with like the Jewish context, most Jews in the progressive world are not fully bilingual with Hebrew and English. Some are for sure. And if you get to like a more of an orthodox environment, you would get like a higher level of fluency. But a lot of Jews who just come to services on a weekly basis in my synagogue, they can maybe read Hebrew, but maybe they can't. Um, and they probably don't know what all of it means. Mm -hmm. But if you put a melody to it, it becomes something that you can remember. I mean, in the same way that like, you know, I can probably recite the Latin mass if I want to, despite not being Catholic, because mm -hmm. I've been singing it since like my children's choir days, you know, and like when you have it that much in your memory, it just kind of sticks. Or the presidents or the states. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Yeah. Like, so it's like, I can also like still sing 50 nifty, you know, like, that's like, <laughs> <laughs> whatever we learned that in like fourth grade or something so yeah. i mean i think that like definitely is like a mnemonic music is a huge help like i think we as human beings 
sometimes we drift away from music as something that is innate, but I do think that it's truly innate. And when we sit together and sing together, it creates this really deep connection that like, actually we've talked about this a lot in my secular choir, like, you know, I, I'm probably one of the only people in the group that would like quasi define myself as religious, but we talk about like the spiritual elements of what we sing and how like when you sing in a group, there's something that happens that transcends the moment. And so you don't have to call that God or religion or anything, but it's like, there's something that's like greater than the sum of its parts. And that's, that doesn't really, it can take a secular moment and make it sacred. Like, I don't know. I remember on a choir retreat at Mac, um, do you remember um, Hark, We Hear the Harps Eternal? Or yeah. that, that song? So we were at, you know, we were at that like retreat center. And for some reason I was late coming from the lodge house, whatever, over to the campfire. And y'all were singing that like as I was walking up and I just remember being like, whoa. And then I got there and I like joined in in the middle and I was just like, there's something deeply spiritual happening here, whether we want to call it religious or not. Like there's something about humans singing that's just really powerful. I don't yeah. even know if that got to your original. No, question. That, what I love about that is um, I've also tried to put my finger on that um, phrase and I've taken it back to um, to music classes at Mac with Mark Mazzullo and, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and learning what the word zeitgeist means, the spirit of the times. And so that, that I've kind of, my version of that is a zeitgeist moment. And we'll get to that again later in the conversation, but where that, where you like, cause you're like plugging in, the spirit is coming alive, uh, yeah. whether you're singing or some people experience it through dancing or, or, mm-hmm. um, even playing instruments, like whatever it is that your connection is, even just listening to a song when you like access that spirit yeah 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 Yeah. oh that's beautiful um so you've written some pretty powerful blogs that i love reading you're such a good writer um and i've kind of over the years you've taken some stands um in the social justice space um can you describe kind of your relationship with social justice as kind of a like gateway into how music kind of fits into this Sure. That's an interesting question. Um, So, I mean, for me, I I know there are some artists who kind of separate their art from what's going on for them emotionally or in the world. Um, For me, they've always been linked. So like a lot of what I've written, not, not like majority of it, but like a good, a good amount of it has come about as a result of something in the world. So, you know, um, there, I remember like, I wrote a song of peace based on a a prayer called Osei Shalom when I like right after one of the too many shootings, I don't remember even remember which one anymore, which is like sad to say, but like, you know, I remember like, after some shooting this, like this particular version of Osei Shalom just like came out of me during COVID. um, Like at the height of the pandemic, I wrote a healing prayer again, based on like a text from the Torah, that again, just was kind of like, it was my way of um, metabolizing what was going on. And so I think that for me, sorry, Brooklyn is going to have sirens, <laughs> apologies, but, um, but, you know, I, th- I think for me, it's, it's a way to engage with the world and provide something that's like generative, um, instead of something that's, you know, more destructive. And so like, for me, writing and music kind of go together with that mm-hmm. in some ways, like sometimes if I, if I want to explain something, I'll write about it. Um, if I want to feel something, I'll typically compose about it. And for whatever reason, the Jewish texts just work well for me. I mean, I do write some melodies without words on occasion. I also will sometimes try to write my own lyrics, but I'm not very good at that. And so like, you know, these texts that are built into the tradition can really help me to just like make sense of what's going on in the world and are like a nice counterpart to the writings that I do. At least I hope so. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and again, during, I remember <clears throat> you've posted on Facebook, I think the one after the shooting you went, did you go live on Facebook or you, I remember you posted the videos maybe, was it that one? I remember I've seen you post um, songs that you've done and just like your way of, and I don't even know sometimes the words, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, but the way that you sing them and, and your intention behind them comes through really strongly and it's just so beautiful. Um, so you play guitar, right? And do you mostly write on guitar? Yeah. 
Yeah, nice. I'm not a very good guitarist. Like I describe myself as like kind of a survival guitarist. Like it's like, you know, I can play well enough to do what I need to write. And that's like, that's nice. But I think the, honestly, I, I'm, I'm left-handed and I learned righty. And I think that that was a mistake, but it's sort of like too late now to like switch and start over. <laughs> Turn it so, upside down. <laughs> yeah. So I'm just kind of yeah. like, I'm, I'm kind of stuck with my, with my left-handed guitar or my left-handed playing of a right-handed guitar. And um, I do my best, but yeah. my partner is a much better guitarist than me. And so sometimes like if I want to record something um, like properly, I'll just be like, can you do the guitar for this? And I'll just sing. And that helps. Yeah. Nice. Nice. So you've talked a little bit about what these songs do for you. Do you write them with an intent to impact others as well? Or are you saying or is it more of an internal thing? What is your experience that way? Um. I mean, I don't know that I write them for other people, but I, but when I write after I write them, I often will want to share them. And it's interesting too, like social media makes this so different. Like I'm shy about playing my stuff in public, like even like for my congregants, like, so we, I'm, we're very lucky to have a, a full-time cantor at my synagogue, which means that like when she's on vacation, I'm like on as like the singer, but most of the time she takes lead on the music and I just like harmonize with her and get to hang out and do that, which is lovely. Nice. Um, so it's rare that I bring my music to my synagogue when she's on the on the Bima, like when she's uh, doing her work with me. But when she's away, like I'll sometimes be like, okay, like I should play something that I wrote, you know, like and bring it in and I get so shy about it and get nervous and usually don't play it very well. But with social media, I just feel so much less scared of sharing it with the world because it's like it's not actually interactive like it is people will like look at it and like it or write a comment or whatever but like it just feels a lot less scary to put it in the world that way so i don't know i i guess i like the idea of sharing what i write but i don't necessarily write it for the community except on occasion there, there have been a couple times where i've been like i'm writing this for a particular group or for a particular moment and i want to make sure that it's out there I do have a hope of recording an album at some point. Um, I keep saying this year and this year keeps shifting. Um, <laughs> but really, year as you said this year. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But my, but my husband actually, like, um, we have sort of a very basic studio set up in oh. our tiny apartment, which um, we have to figure out. We, we have to, anyway, long story short, um, we, we have like what we need to do, like a very basic, like guitar, bass, drums, like voice setup. And so, I'm hoping that this maybe will be the year, maybe this summer it'll actually happen. Cause I'd love to like actually do a cohesive album as opposed to just like, oh, here's a piece, here's a piece, here's a piece. Yeah, yeah. When you would write that, so would you write fresh stuff for that or, or do you have like ideas of like, oh, I've written these songs that would go together. I'm always curious how people put albums together. Yeah, I mean, I, I haven't, well, I mean, so I have a nice little structure because it would be based on the Friday night Shabbat service. So it'd be like, okay, like we're gonna do, like this melody to open and then like some of the stuff I've written and some of the stuff I'm like, okay, I'd want to write a piece that is for this particular prayer. Um, and I, I think I want to do a mix of like, I want to do mostly prayers that are already set in the liturgy, but like sure. one or two that would maybe have like original lyrics or like, you know, going in a slightly different direction. So I have a, I have a basic outline. I just haven't written half the stuff and I definitely haven't recorded any of the stuff. Sure. Sure. Oh, this is so interesting. I, I know we'll get to the social justice stuff, but I'm just curious. Yeah. I love hearing how people approach uh, songwriting. So you're using the sacred texts and then are you using the melodies, like traditional melodies as like a basis and then playing with them or are you completely coming up with original melodies most of the time? Usually original melodies. Once in a while, I'll take the nusach, which is like the traditional melody and I'll like try to use that same mode, but there's a, I mean, there is this rich tradition in the Jewish community. And again, especially with like this kind of renaissance of the last 20 years of just like writing your own melodies for things. So, and then you teach them to the community. So like there's a piece of the Shabbat service every week called L'Chad Odi, which is like a, it's a medieval uh, entry into Shabbat where basically like Shabbat is personified as like a bride. And so it's like the chorus is like, come, let's go and greet the bride. Let's bring the Sabbath presence within like in, in Hebrew. but it's it's got a billion different tunes like if you look up like lechado d melodies you'll get like at least a hundred different options and so like i wrote 
two of those, um, like one fast, one slow, because it's also a very long song. It's like nine verses with the chorus in between. And so often if people are doing all nine verses, they'll switch melodies halfway through. So they'll do like a slow one and then switch to a fast one or vice versa. So like I did that. Um, and so that's one of the, that's one of the few bits of the album that's like already written. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just a mix of mix of things. Nice. Nice. So people have used music in social justice for a really long time. There's always been protest tunes. There's always been, you know, union uh, tunes. There's always been marches. Um, what is your thought of how you put music into um, these spaces where you want to process something that happened or see change moving forward? Like, what is your, what, what do you bring into that when you write your, your music? It's interesting. Like, so protest songs are very specific yeah. because protest songs need to be very singable. They need to have repetitive melodies, probably not have a huge range, be very rhythmic. Like, you know, so, so a protest song is something like if I were to try to write a protest song, I would be very specific about like, I'm trying to write a thing that we could use at a protest. Um, most of what I write is not that. Some of it, I guess, could be, but um, you know, most of what I write is maybe it carries a social justice message, but it's not specifically meant to be sung in like a group setting like a protest or a march or a rally. Um, but I know amazing composers who do write for that. It's just not something that I'm, I mean, maybe I could be good at it, but I tend to get told that my stuff is complicated. So <laughs> that makes it a lot harder to like bring to like a, a march. So I, I haven't really done too much with that. but. You know, there's there's been a lot of Jewish music written recently, particularly since October 7th, like um, where there's been this, you know, crazy war going on and people have very different opinions. But you can see both for um, Jews on the more pro Israel side and for Jews who are more critical of Israel, there's been new music that's been written and brought to these different rallies and these different marches. And that's that's cool to see in its own way, like regardless of the politics. Yeah, definitely. Um, so, so then when you decide that you're going to write a song that could be, um, and I love, again, Anastasia, um, said about dance that because it's people coming together, all dance is political. Mm. Um, and I just, I just thought that was so interesting. And I think maybe some of the same could be said, um, about Jewish music at this time. I don't know, <laughs> but yeah. like, how, well, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, like it is like there's there's been actually like some kind of intense controversies around some of this. So there's a rabbi named Menachem Creditor who wrote a piece um, shortly after 9-11 when his child was born um, called Olam Chesed Yimane, which means we will build this world from love. Um, there are a number of Jewish groups that have that have been using that song at rallies that were advocating for the well-being of Gazans and Palestinians. And this rabbi um, basically forbade them to use his song because he said that like it was against the people of Israel and like, you know, that it was not OK. And like they were like, you know, taking his song hostage and blah, blah, blah. And so, you know, groups have had really different reactions. Some groups have said like good riddance, if you're going to be this kind of person, like we don't want to sing your music anymore. And others have said like but we really like the message of this song and like, you know, this idea of building the world from love, which is like what we're trying to do, even if like our method of doing so is not the same as the method that that you would think is right. So I've heard that come up most prominently with with that particular song, but I think in a couple of other places as well, where it's like, you know, okay, if you're choosing to use this person's melody or this person's music, what does that mean? There, there's a, a rabbi who died a number of years ago named Shlomo Karlbach, and he was probably one of the most prolific and powerful Jewish composers for a long time. He has also been incredibly accused of sexual assault and sexual harassment in a major way. So many synagogues, including mine, will not use his melodies. Um, the melodies are gorgeous and they're catchy and people like them. And so often when I'm finding myself in a Jewish space that's like meant to be accessible, you'll hear a lot of Karl Bach because it's like what people know. Mm -hmm. And to change that, you have to bring in a bunch of new melodies and teach them and get people to really process them properly, which takes time. So, you know, I think with all of this, it's like, 
you know, of course there's a social justice element to all music and it's like considering the composer considering the context considering like you know there's also melodies that are written in orthodox world where women are not allowed to sing um, which is not true across all of orthodoxy but in like the most stringent um, ultra orthodox communities there's this concept of kolisha which means the voice of a woman and women are literally not permitted to sing and so it's like if you have a melody that you love from that community do you reclaim it by saying mm. like we're women and we're going to sing this do we say no we like don't want to touch that because we don't appreciate the values of the people that wrote it um it's you know there's always a lot of a lot to talk about with that. Emily has a blog called More Than Four Questions, a millennial rabbi's musings on modern religion, where she tackles some really hard topics, including COVID anxiety during the pandemic, student debt relief, interfaith Jewish families, and challenges of inclusivity in Jewish communities. She's even written articles for Teen Vogue. And, of course, she's tackled the awful situation in Gaza and the feelings of hatred and grief that people on both sides are feeling. Just this week, she published a post titled, What is our anger doing for us? On letting our foundations be rocked. While we're talking about her music on this podcast episode, I love reading her writing, and I definitely recommend checking it out. The link to all of her stuff is in the description. And while you're online, don't forget to head over to zeitgeistacademy.com slash radio and sign up for my newsletter. I send you cool musical stuff every week. That's Z-E-I-T-G-E-I-S-T academy dot com slash radio. What are some of the common themes that you like to write about, just basically? Um, you know, a lot of like peace stuff. For sure. Like, I mean, part of the interesting thing about the Jewish landscape is that, like, even though there's tons of liturgy, yeah. if you were to, like look at a um, a service in my synagogue or many other synagogues that are similar to mine, you would have maybe like 20 or so common pieces to choose from as far as the liturgy. And so I've written to probably like half of those over the years, like just because they're they're there. I don't always like what I write, you know, a year or two later. And so there's actually sometimes where I've written like more than one melody for a particular piece. Um, and then there's also stuff from the Torah itself, like as opposed to from the from the prayer book. And so that is a lot of generative stuff too. Like just like, what can we do with, like there, there's a passage in um, the Noah story where it's like God saying like, never again will I do this kind of stuff. Like, you know, like we're gonna have a better world and like i set that to music a couple of years ago like going along with the the torah portion of the week because every week in judaism there's a different torah portion um, over the course of the year and so like you know focusing on like connection focusing on community um i i prefer to do that kind of message i think and then um sometimes it's just a matter of like what makes sense with like okay we it, like this melody that we always use for sadiq katamar annoys me because it sounds like Disneyland. So like, let's write a new thing for this just because it's a piece that we do almost every week. So like, let's have a different tune. Um, you know, and that that's kind of part of it too. Sometimes like I've actually asked people like I remember when I was in rabbinical school, I would ask classmates, like, what do you need a new tune for? And they would tell me and I would try to write for them. Um, and sometimes successfully, sometimes not so much. Are your families like open? Like how? how how much change before they i don't know is that like just part of the culture like yeah you sing a different melody to this all the time like so some people yes some people no. some people yeah. love new melodies and they would yeah. like happily learn new ones each week others are like this is the tune for adon olam why are you doing a different tune um right. you know and that just depends on the person um you know i remember my my grandpa complaining about like how they had these new tunes at his synagogue and um you know he was just like but that's not the melody that i know and so i think it partly depends on like how musical are you but also like how much do you want to like have your shabbat experience be a learning experience as opposed to like a comfort experience sure. you know like so we try to do i would say 80 percent to 90 percent familiar at each service then we might introduce one or two things that are different than what we typically would do and then it builds over time like i would say like right now i, I know i've talked about lachado d before like my congregation probably knows at least six melodies for lachado d just because we kind of cycle through them and then they might sort of tangentially know like two or three but like not not fully 
Um, and every synagogue is different. So like we sometimes have visitors who are like, you do all different tunes from my synagogue, even if they come from another reconstructionist synagogue, just because everywhere you go, it's a little bit different. Yeah. So when you're teaching, when you write something that, that you are bringing to them, um, you mentioned it's an oral tradition. Do you teach it orally or do you have sheet music for it or what do you do with people? I almost never have sheet music. Okay. Um, actually it was very sweet that uh, about a year ago, um, they did. So like, there's something called an installation when you're like at, in a new synagogue, they install you as the clergy, like, like in a refrigerator. Um, but like, <laughs> but, but it's like this lovely like service where like, you know, like people say nice things about you and you give like a speech and whatever. But, um, but we have a wonderful person in our congregation who's a composer and, um, he's written a ton of amazing Jewish music and he, was kind enough to like take something that I'd written that was just like a chant that I'd really freestyled. Um, like again, with with my husband and like our studio setup, I can just be like, hey, can you turn the studio on? And I can just like loop over myself kind of thing. Nice. And so I did that for this chant. And this wonderful person in the congregation tried to like notate it and set it up for our choir at the synagogue, which was really cool. Um, but also like, I never write things with like sheet music, except like once in a while. Um, so they they sang this piece and it was like really cool to hear my so melody, cool. but also I was just like, I don't even know how you wrote that down. Cause like I didn't <laughs> think about it. Um, I, I have occasionally tried to set things for choir. So like I wrote a piece that actually that same composer in our congregation was like, I'd, I'd sung it solo at some point, like just with guitar. And he was like, you know, this feels to me like it wants to be bigger, like this would be really great for choir. And so I did try to arrange it and like <clears throat> we haven't actually sung it at the synagogue or anywhere else. But like I, I've, I'm it's a work in progress. Maybe like next year we'll actually try to try to sing it because it, it, it's cool. But it, but it's it's rare that I would do notes. So usually both for me and for the cantor that I work with, if we're bringing a new melody, if it's simple, we'll just sing it together a couple times and hope people catch on. And if it's like more complicated, we'll literally do call and response and just try to get people to learn it. And sometimes if it's yeah. extra complicated, we'll do like part A one week and part B the next week and then try to put them together. It's just like a choir rehearsal with your congregation. <laughs> yeah, without sheet music. Without so, sheet music. Yeah, yeah, here, remember this for two weeks, okay? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, actually, like there's a there's a thing that like somebody taught me like when I was in rabbinical school about like the four levels of knowing a melody. So there's like not knowing it at all, right? There's knowing it well enough that like you can sing it with somebody else. Um, and then there's knowing it well enough that you can sing it if somebody sings the first three notes. Mm -hmm. And then there's knowing it well enough that you can pick it out of the air. So like we have a lot of things at my synagogue that I would say are like level two. It's like if others are singing it, they can get it. We have a few things where people can catch on if it's like you sing the first few notes together and then it's like, okay, when can we get to that fourth level where like we can just say we're going to do like that melody and you just know what it is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, again, I'm so ignorant. I'm so sorry. <laughs> is, are your services kind of, again, like um, Catholic masses, very regimented. You do this thing yeah. and then this and then this and it's very detailed and laid out. Um, is that kind of the same with your services? Um, yes and no. There's like some things that are going to be true every single week. So like there's yeah. always a call to prayer. Um, there's always like this prayer called the Shema, which is like we don't have a credo in Judaism, but like this would be the closest thing to it. It's like, you know, here, O Israel, um, Adonai is our God, Adonai is one. And so like, you know, that's going to be there every week, sometimes different melodies, but like those two prayers will be there. There's, um, you know, the Amidah, which is like this central prayer, and then the Kaddish, which is the prayer for those who've died. And so like those elements, no matter what, you know, you're not going to have a service without without those. And there's many other things that will show up 80% of the time, but there is some flexibility um, within all of that. So there's just a few things that are like absolutely required every single service. Got it. Got it. Um, and then do you direct the choir? No, um, we have a, actually a wonderful congregant who directs the choir and comes from like an acapella background and is a lawyer in his like real life job, but like nice. also has a deep love for music. And the choir is really sweet. It's like we have, um, I think our youngest member is 12 and the oldest oh. is 80. And, you know, it's just like it's not, it's not audition. And some people are like really great musicians and others are people that have a deep love for music. And like we just all kind of come together and 
practice, but the choir doesn't perform regularly. The choir performs okay. for like special services a few times a year, but it's just members within the congregation. And then we also have a band that rehearses, not that rehearses, that performs um, once a month for Shabbat services and then also for like our special high holy day services in the fall. So that's really nice. sweet too. Nice, nice. Yeah. So uh, going back to instruments. So you play guitar. When you're writing, um, do you tend, because again, you mentioned that like klezmer, for example, is in like different modes, uh, mm -hmm. not non-Western. Uh, what do you tend to use like tonally when you're writing? I don't really, I guess I don't really think of it that way. Like I just, okay. the way that I write, well, okay. There's a couple of different approaches. There's like the, there's, there's Emily without a guitar and there's Emily with a guitar. If it's Emily with a guitar, chances are high that it's going to go A minor, G, D minor, A minor. Um, you know, <laughs> and like there's going to be like some kind of thing going on there. Yeah. Um, and I mean, you know, so like I have a couple kind of like standard progressions that I feel comfortable playing and like working with. Um, without a guitar, I get more creative and Sometimes my partner will also be like, all of your stuff is in the same meter. I'm going to put on a drum loop for you and you need to like work on something over that instead, you know, so we'll just put on like a drum loop on YouTube or something and be like, you know, right to that instead of to like your normal, like, what's your normal meter? I don't know. It's probably just four, four, um, you know, like, I think it's just like kind of a very basic, like four, four situation, um, huh. most of the time. And so sometimes I'll do a six, eight or like a, you know, an equivalent, but it's interesting, you know, I was a music minor at Mac and I did take like three semesters of theory and like I in theory, I, in theory, I do know like how all of this works, but it's been so long since I've actually worked with like proper understanding of like what is meter, what is like, you know, like what are these key signatures like I use it a little bit for choir, but even there I've had to I've had to really work on renewing my memory of how rhythm works because um, it's it's just like not my it, it was never my strong suit. And now it's like especially foreign because I'm not rehearsing four days a week. Um, right. In, right. In kind of situation. Yeah. 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 Interesting. Let's talk a little bit about you've mentioned several other people. Um, it sounds like there's kind of a, a whole community around um, well, Jewish people writing music and then also potentially um, going back to some of the social justice themes, mm -hmm. um, pe Jewish people writing social justice-esque music, whether yeah. that means, I don't necessarily mean like for protest, but like with the potential, like the, the direct intent of m making a message of whether it's equality or peace or whatever in the world. Mm -hmm. Um, what is, who are like some of the people that are out there and you've mentioned some names already, but like, mm -hmm. like who are some of these people who are, who are writing this and, and what is, what is their, uh, kind of world like? In, yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah. some of these folks I know personally, others, I just know, you know, by their, by their music, but yeah. like the first person who comes to mind is Batya Levine. Um, they're based in Philly and, um, they've put out one album. I want to say they're working on a second and, the album that I know just has like a mix of um, like traditional prayer melodies, but I mean, not the melodies are not traditional, but the prayers are traditional that they've set music to, but then um, also like these lovely, um, really powerful statements, like um, one of their um, pieces that we actually sang in our high holy day services this year is just, the words are just, we are good, we are flawed, we are the breath of an imperfect God. Um, and I love that. And like, so it's that kind of message where it's like getting people to feel drawn in and getting people to feel connected to something that might feel a little bit foreign. Like, I think that's a big problem we have in the Jewish world in general is like the Hebrew thing is such a high barrier to entry. So like, if you happened to be raised with it, lovely, you know, everything that's great. But like, many Jews were not. And then, of course, there's tons of people who come into Judaism, like, you know, who were not raised Jewish, but they convert to Judaism. And like, so they don't have that knowledge. And so when there's stuff written in English that's still kind of liturgically grounded, it's a really beautiful way. And that almost to me feels like justice work within the Jewish world, because mm -hmm. it's saying like, you don't need to know every one of these Hebrew words in order to feel connected to this tradition that you're engaging with. Um, so they're, they're a wonderful one. Um, let's see. 
Yosef Goldman is a rabbi who I think is based currently in the Baltimore area or somewhere in Maryland, but actually I think I think he's moving to New York this summer and like and um, he also put out an album a year or two ago that was like this really beautiful mix of um, like old stuff and new stuff, but one of the pieces that I remember very clearly from that is um, just we are loved by an unending love, which is a take on um, this prayer that we do as part of the Shabbat evening service every week, but he put it in English and then said like that the B part is like open up my heart. I know I am love. I know I am loved, you know, and it's just like, again, this way in for people. So and that's something that I've actually heard sung in some protest context, too, because it's a little bit more repetitive and like easy to get to. Yeah. So th those folks come to mind. Nice. Nice. Awesome. Uh, I will try to put links, find those people and put links in the podcast notes. I can also send you stuff if you can't find them. Oh, that would be amazing. Yeah. yeah. Just yeah. for people to go. I think it's interesting because again, I'm so choral. <laughs> it was yeah. funny. I was, uh, I'm on the reunion committee, uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, for Mac and, um, they were trying to figure out like who is doing things that like they, like the hobbies they did at McAllister right. still doing them. And I was like, oh man, I am like, I'm in an acapella group. I'm in a, a you know large choir, mixed choir. That seems, like I'm doing all the same stuff. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, I love it. <laughs> I'm very consistent. Yeah. <laughs> but in that world, I I love hearing the plethora, like how much music there is, um, Jewish music, and it's also making me kind of sad because um, every like winter song esque concert, right. there's like they try to do something you know they try to include all traditions and put something right. jewish in and it's usually either not that interesting or it's like yeah. dreidels or like you know uh, something really <laughs> yeah. like um and so hearing that there's like all of this rich tradition that is yeah. uh i wonder like where that divide why that divide is so strict yeah. I think part of it is that we don't have as much written out like it really is oral, yeah. and a lot of it is just like natural harmonies so it's like you know if you're listening even to a like recording like somebody's album it might have been that they said okay like you take like you know the third above and you do this thing or whatever but i think it's not unlikely that even some of that stuff was not choreographed you know that it was mm -hmm. just like you're gonna sing you're gonna harmonize like I mean, that's what I do with the cantor that I work with all the time. Like I like there's some pieces that like we do often enough that I just kind of have a standard harmony that I do. But sometimes like if I'm tired, like I've been having a bit of a vocal part crisis for the last couple of years. I don't even know. I'm like a soprato at this point, And like <laughs> it's confusing. Like sometimes I'm like I want to be up here and sometimes I want to be down here. And like anyway, so like sometimes when I'm when I'm leading services with her, I'll just be like, and we're going to do lower harmonies today. Like that's just like where we are. Um, and I'm, I'm lucky to have an ear where like, usually I can figure stuff out, yeah, but that's awesome. Um, but like, that's something that, you know, in the Jewish oral tradition, it is just like a lot of singing and people either picking up the melody or if they have the skill, picking up the harmony or like bringing in the table percussion, like there's a lot of hand drumming and things like that. And so it's a natural approach, but it's really different from choral stuff. And I actually mm -hmm. remember having this experience, like I, you know, I love music and I love choral music. And some of the most spiritual experiences I've had in my life, like I mentioned earlier, have been singing in a choral context and like a more like kind of classical context. And like sometimes singing like actually like Christian music, but with like people that sing. And I remember like when I was in rabbinical school one year, I went to this introduction to like, you know, the art of of singing, you know, Jewish music and it was the first time that I actually felt that same sense of power singing Jewishly as I'd felt singing secularly because the person running the space, this guy, Joey Weisenberg, that I mentioned earlier, was just like very deliberate about creating this spiritual mode and also making sure that we were in it. Like, so people started breaking into harmonies after we'd learned this melody just a couple of times. And he was like, nope, we're too early for harmonies. Like, you got to learn the melody first and like stop people because he's like, people that can do harmonies just like take it as an excuse not to learn the melody and like you know and so um I know, feel attacked I was, yeah I felt very attacked but I also like started singing the melody um you know but it's like and I did have this experience of like when we actually when it actually was like okay you can bring in the harmonies now and people just like started like 
breaking in, I was like, oh, this is like what I'd been missing when, when I was like doing Jewish music in the past. Cause a lot of it's just, a lot of the Jewish music that's been written for choir is so dry and kind of sanitized that it's mm -hmm. difficult to like figure out even what it's supposed to be. And I would love to crack that code because I, I would love to have Jewish music for choir that actually feels genuine, but also is fun to sing in a choral context. And you're not just like having like the melody sung by the sopranos and everybody else kind of doing like some weird stuff in the background. Like, but I, I don't know quite how to do that yet because there's just like an authenticity to the spontaneous singing of it that's harder to bring in if you're codifying it. Yeah. Yeah. There was, when I was in the Portland Symphonic Choir, um, we had a man, Shlomo Farber, who wrote, um, he was frustrated by that as well. And he was a composer uh, generally, and, and he wrote um, a piece, and I should have looked it up before, <laughs> I guess I was thinking about it, but he wrote a piece for us and it was beautiful, but it was it was very interesting to like, um, it, and the point was that it's like, no, this is, a, this is more of a traditional, like uh, what we would actually say in synagogue. It's not, you know, yeah. he wanted to kind of start to break that mold and it was actually quite challenging. Um, and I kind of chalked it up to his writing being very uh, complex and mm -hmm. it was very good. Um, but maybe that's also just coming from the tradition because his was complex and you mentioned yours is complex and <laughs> maybe i don't know but it was a beautiful piece i'll look that up as well and put it in the in the notes um and i think he promoted it around a little bit because other choirs were also trying to find anything that was written down because us classical western trained people cannot not have sheet music in front of right. us <laughs> right which i get although I, but i've had the opposite problem actually sometimes too so there's a, a unitarian universalist society in in new york that we've partnered with occasionally and done like interfaith programming with and so they were doing a program around hanukkah and they asked me if i could come and like be there for that for that service and like sing and and like do some speaking with their with their minister and i said sure and um so i partnered with their music minister to like figure out the music for it and, and in their hymnal they had a couple of hanukkah pieces and so i was like sure like if you want to do these because like he had suggested it i was like yeah we can definitely do these but it was sheet music right and so it was not quite right like it was like somebody had like again kind of like made it more standard than it should have been and so like this wonderful pianist like super talented could like switch keys without thinking about it like that kind of thing um was like trying to like do this with me and i kept doing it wrong because like i knew like the oral version that was not the same as like this written version because it was like oh there's supposed to be like a grace note there that like isn't in this music or like you're supposed to like it's not really an eighth note even though it says it's like just two eighth notes it's really more like probably like a dotted quarter and like you know like it's just like it's not quite yeah the same thing. so it was really funny to try to like get on meter for for that for him yeah it worked out mostly <laughs> what what do you want people to know just generally um i think most of my audience does not have a lot of experience with jewish music like what are some what are some things that you wish people knew um I mean, I think like when it comes to Judaism in general, there's a lot of stereotypes and I, in some ways I'm a walking like rebuttal to those stereotypes because like I am young and female and uh, queer and part of an interfaith family and like it on and on and on. Like, you know, so in some ways, just like by being who I am, I um, show that some of those stereotypes are not true. Like when you put rabbi in front of my name, it like confuses people. Um, I still probably have a conversation at least every month or two with somebody who's like, I didn't know women could be rabbis. And I'm like, it's been 50 years, but <laughs> thank you. Um, you have you a know. great, a great blog article on that. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I think like that's, that's part of it, but that goes for social justice as well. That like, I think again, there's a lot of, there's a lot of people who understandably because of the way that the media works in the United States, think that religion is right wing. Um, and that religion is something that justifies conservative stances and that justifies like, you know, putting women in their place and like not having LGBTQ folks have equal rights and all of that. And I am a huge proponent of the religious and spiritual left where it's like actually part of why I believe the things that I believe about equality, about justice, about making this world better is not in spite of being part of a religious community, but because of it, that like I am really somebody who 
my my activism informs my Judaism. My Judaism informs my activism. Like I can't separate them out from each other. Um, and it's just always been kind of who I am. And then my music is something that just is part of that, that like, you know, I, I write because it helps to soothe me when things are crazy. I write because it helps me to feel held when um, the world is feeling like it's coming off the hinges. And I also write because it is a way for me to connect with people who might feel equally upset or equally at sea. Um, and so I guess, you know, I, it, I'm not in the business of saying like people should be involved in religious communities if it's not for them, but I am in the business of saying that we need communities in general, and that can that can be a religious community. It can be a choir, it can be a sports team, but like we need places to be connected. And I think music is a connecting point, justice is a connecting point, and religion is a connecting point. Yeah, 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 that's amazing. I remember being really surprised when you went to rabbinical school. I think uh, that surprised people a lot more than when I came out as queer. Yeah. Definitely, um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. But I think it's like there's a responsibility. Like it's like yeah. if people like me don't become rabbis, then like then we are just going to have like this divide between like the secular left and the religious right. And like I just don't believe that that's a dichotomy that actually serves anybody because I think like it's totally fair for people to live to leave religious communities that don't serve them. Like totally mm -hmm. fair. Um, and I think that religious community can do a lot. I mean, partly not to get too deep into this, like. I have congregants who are in their 20s. I don't mean like children. There's also children who are congregants, but I have like adult congregants in their 20s and adult congregants in their 90s. And when they show up at services together, we just don't have that many places in mm -hmm. our common, in our modern society where like you actually have intergenerational connections. And so yeah. like as much as like there's challenges in having intergenerational community, I really love those moments where we have people coming together across these different divides and like working for a better world. Um, there's a concept in Judaism, tikkun olam, which is repairing the world. And it comes from like this ancient, um, you know, mystical tradition relating to like goodness being poured into jugs and bursting and like complicated stuff. But its modern application really is just about repairing the world and trying to make it a better place for everybody to live. And that's just as Jewish as, you know, the people saying that women shouldn't sing. I would right. say it's more Jewish. But. Right, right, right. Yeah. So I I like to end uh, the podcast. We kind of went into what a zeitgeist moment is earlier. Um, so uh, just to quickly recap, it's where you feel connected through music to something bigger than yourself. Um, and so I'll ask you what was either a recent or a memorable zeitgeist moment. And while you think on that, I'll go I'll go with one. Yeah. Please. Um, and really, so again, Emily and I were in choir in McAllister, and I just have such memories of, you know, we would have these concerts and then we'd have the after parties and the, you know, we call it drunk cappella, where we would just like, we just sung for like however many hours after a week of like prep rehearsals of singing for hours and hours and hours and hours. And then we'd do the concert and then we'd go to somebody's house and just sing for hours and hours <laughs> and after that. Um, and I just have so many, it's rather than like a single defining moment, I just have so many like, like warm and wonderful moments of standing next to you because we were both sopranos and just like, like watching you sing. And it was just like in just a purely joyful, this was like year after year after year, you know, like it's like this collage in my head of just singing in such joy with you and all of these other people. And and it was, you know, it was raucous for a little bit, but then it was always kind of hit that moment where it would just like calm down and we'd sing the slower stuff. And we were just all like so overwhelmed with this incredible music that we were making together that we just never wanted to stop like we'd go on tours and the entire i remember the bus drivers being like oh my god <laughs> we never stopped singing yeah. so, and that is just such like formative memories for me of special moments of being connected to uh to these people on such a level like like I don't know. It's, it was truly a magical, magical series of moments. Yeah. Um, just of, of making music with you and watching you sing. 
So I love that. And I agree so much. Like there's, there's nothing like college choir. There's really it's not, really not. <laughs> like, you know, we rehearsed like, I mean, if you include women's choir, we rehearsed yeah. four days a week, we rehearsed six hours a week. It was like, and for those of us that joined when we were freshmen, it was like, you know, all four years of our college experience were just like 4.30 to six was booked, you know, yeah. like that was just what it was. And like, I feel so lucky that I got to do that. Um, yeah. I won't steal what you just said, although I definitely could, because like I, I resonate and agree with every word. Um, but I'll, I, like the first thing that came to mind was also a choir tour um, that my secular choir took actually a few months before the pandemic, we went to Serbia, wow. um, which was incredible. And um, we, ha we were mostly like going around doing different things, but like we had an afternoon where we were free in Belgrade. And so a few of us took like an organized, like kind of van tour thing, just cause we were like, we only had like part of a day. We wanted to like see some different sites. And so um, the driver brought us to like this, um, this church that had this incredible like underground crypt situation that was very beautiful. And there were maybe like, I don't know, like seven or eight of us. And we happened to be relatively well split with voice parts. Like there might've been like three sopranos, one alto or something, but it was like, you know, reasonable. And so there's a very famous Serbian composer whose name I of course am completely blanking on, but he'd set this piece Tebe Poem, um, which is like used in a lot of um, like Orthodox, like, like a, you know, uh, Christian Orthodox settings. And um, we just started singing this like in this really resonant space like this group of like americans like yeah. and just like we're gonna do this okay i guess we're gonna do this and like all of these people were just like stopping to like stare at like this choir just like you know spontaneously singing and it was just like very genuine and pure and lovely and the same thing you were talking about like just these moments of like we're doing this for the joy of it. This isn't a performance. Like, yes, technically you're performing, but like, that's not what it's about. It's about just like making this music and like bringing this out into the world. And isn't that amazing? And let's yes. do it all the time. Yes, let's do it all the time. I try to do it all the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's so beautiful. Well, Emily, thank you so much for being on my podcast. Yeah, it's been thank delightful. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm so excited that I got to do this with you. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in to this episode of Zeitgeist Radio. If you'd like to take the next step in your musical journey, head over to zeitgeistacademy.com slash radio to join my newsletter. Seriously, it's fun and informative, and I never spam or sell your information. That's zeitgeistacademy.com slash radio. Music for this episode was created by Ian Boswell. Please hit that subscribe button and tell all your friends you found a cool new podcast. See you next time. Yeah. <laughs>